نحمده ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القران المجيد بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الدين عند الله الاسلام one of the most unique things about the seerah and the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that when the Muslims began to gain a bit of power when they had turned Medina into a base for Islam he had letters written and sent to the rulers of every major power of that time to all the surrounding countries near Arabia he wrote letters to their rulers inviting them to Islam. Now this is something which was very unique for that time because we don't see this as a normal practice of, of, of people of that time that people would preach their religion to the ruler of another country. If we look at the world's religions, a lot of people say there are so many religions in the world. How do we know which one is true? Well, you can narrow it down to a variety of different ways. One way you can narrow it down is you can look at which religion commands people to preach its message to other people. And out of all the hundreds of religions in the world, there are really only three that have this nature of, of preaching your religion to others. Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism. These are the only three, right? Hindus don't preach or try to convert people to Hinduism. It's not part of their religion. The, Jew, the Jewish nation, they do not preach <coughs> Judaism or try to convert people to Judaism because it's not part of their religion. There's only three religions that have this feature. And from the three, there's only one where it traces right back to its founder. Because Isa alayhi salam came with his message to the Israelites. His message wasn't for the world. It was later on that people turned into a global religion. Same with Buddha. And he was sent to the people of India, uh, and Allah knows best, but a lot of people believe he may have been a prophet, and I also am of, of that opinion. But it seems that he was sent to the people of India, and later on his message was corrupted and became a global religion. Islam is the only religion where you can go right back to the person who started it, and you see him sending his message across the globe. This is the only message that goes across the globe from the very beginning. And that is the topic of today, that Islam is a universal religion. We've learned that Islam is the religion of ease, it's the religion of good character, it's the religion of nasiha, of sincere advice, and we learned that it's the religion of the fitra, and it's the religion of haya. Today, we will look at the fact that Islam is, in its nature and at its core, a universal message, a call and an invitation to the entire world towards a better way of life a superior way of living towards a life of ihsan a life that benefits you in this world and the next a life that brings inner peace a life that brings purpose a life that helps you to cope with debt a life that helps you to prepare for the afterlife and a life that makes you realize no matter how happy you get in this world there is a better happiness waiting for you in the next and so we look at the messages of the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the unique thing about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that every messenger before him was sent to a specific tribe or a specific country. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the only messenger sent for the entire world. And therefore his message had to be suitable to work in every time and every place and every culture. And so he was sent with a sharia that is fixed in its fundamentals but flexible in its secondary issues so it can be implemented in every time and every place and every culture. So he came with a message that was universal in its values. From the universal values of this religion is that Islam is the religion of Tawheed and Tawheed is part of the fitra of humanity. So people in any part of the world can recognize Tawheed as something that makes sense. They can recognize the message of the oneness of Allah as something that makes sense. This is a universal belief. It is a belief that all humans and all jinn as well <coughs> naturally know and believe and all animals and all plants as well and even the earth itself this tawheed is part of every creation of Allah and so it's part of the universal message of Islam 
from the universal message of Islam is its call towards good character. That good character is something that again every culture in the world recognizes. Every culture in the world loves people of good character. Every culture in the world is attracted towards good character. And so when Muslims practice Islam and we become people of good character, we attract people towards Islam. But as we said a few weeks ago, Islam doesn't just call towards good character, it calls towards the best of character. Ihsan in our, in our khuluq, to the very best and perfection of human character. From the universal message of Islam is justice. One of the fundamentals of our religion is universal justice. A justice that applies to everybody. You know, there's this practice found in almost every culture in, in history that's wrong. And the people recognize it as wrong. And people very rarely speak against it. And that's the practice of when a person from a noble lineage or wealthy family or an influential family does something wrong, people let it slide. And when somebody who is poor or downtrodden or not looked up to by society commits the same crime, that person receives the full force of the law. Islam came to change this. And so in the life of Rasulullah wasallam, there was a woman from the Quraysh who had a habit of stealing. And one day she got caught. And she was from one of the most noble families of the Quraysh. And so this culture was still there amongst the people that we can't let a noble woman's hand be amputated. So they wanted to ask Rasulullah وسلم, to let it slide. So they told Usama ibn Zayd to go and speak to him. Why Usama ibn Zayd? Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhuma, is the son of the adopted son of Rasulullah وسلم, Zayd ibn Haritha. So he is like a grandson to Rasulullah وسلم, very very close. Right? When Rasulullah وسلم, used to sit, he used to put his biological grandson uh, Hussein or Hassan or Wani and Usama his adopted gra- grandson on his abid he used to treat them equally right so this is the family of Rasulullah SAW in a way he's not biologically his family but in terms of how he was raised and the close relationship they had in that way so they thought if someone this close to Rasulullah SAW speaks to him maybe he'll go soft so Usama anhu, he goes to Rasulullah SAW and he tries to he, he asked him about this. He says that, you know, can we just not have her hand chopped off? Can we just not have the, the punishment applied to her? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he gets angry. The hadith said you could see anger in his face. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa does not get angry easily or quickly. But at this moment he gets angry. And he decides to give a khutbah. And this is from the beautiful akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when he wants to correct society, he does not call people out by name. He does not do what we have today, this, this shaming and call out culture. No. He gives a generic khutbah where he addresses the point so everybody gets the message without anyone getting embarrassed. And he gives a khutbah and he says, what is wrong with people? The nations before you were destroyed because when noble people did something wrong, they let it go. And when the poor people did something wrong, they applied to law to, the law to them. He said, even if my own daughter Fatima had to steal, we would apply the law to her. This is the universal justice of Islam. Doesn't matter who commits the crime. Doesn't matter who they are related to. Doesn't matter what their lineage is. Doesn't matter how pious they are. When someone does something wrong, justice is carried out. And so this is something that attracted people towards Islam in the early days. So Islam is a universal religion. And we see this today also in the fact that it is and it remains, despite what people are saying, the fastest growing religion in the world. Where approximately 24% of the world now follows Islam. And inshallah, within our lifetime, you will see it grow to be the majority religion of the world. What attracts people towards Islam? Well, one can say one of the reasons that Muslims are growing so fast is that we have more children than anybody else. And that's true, right? So, Alhamdulillah, it's actually a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu told us to do that. He said, have a lot of children so we can have be many in number on the Day of Judgment. So that is part of it. But also people convert to Islam all the time. Many of my teachers, many of my friends, many of my students are people who were born into other ways of life and they converted to Islam. And all of them were attracted to the universal message of Islam. And so one of the things I want us to take home from this, one of the points I want us, the practical point I want us to take from all of this is 
for us to make da'wah a part of our lives in whichever way we can. Islam is a universal religion. And our job as the ambassadors of Islam is to make sure the message reaches as many people as possible. Now, whether people accept the message or not is between them and Allah. Our job is to get the message out there through our character, through our lifestyles, through our contributions to society, through the way we represent Islam in our speech, in our manners, in our actions, and in speaking to people directly as well. Get the message of Islam out there to your neighbors, to your friends, to the people you work with. It doesn't have to be in a preachy way. Sometimes it can be as simple as being a practicing Muslim in their environment. Now, be the practicing Muslim in their environment. I know some people in our community who are so good at this, that if they have to move out of their neighborhood, their non-Muslim neighbors will cry because they say that the person who God's blessing is coming upon us because this person's our neighbor. They see this in the person, they feel it in the person. Why? Because they, these people represent the values of Islam and how we treat our neighbors. And so we believe Islam is a universal religion. It is a message meant for all of mankind and a message that's applicable in every time and every place and every culture. And a message that someone who is seeking the truth sincerely from any background will be able to recognize the beauty of Islam, to embrace Islam, to find inner peace in Islam, and to be able to live a purposeful, happy life because of Islam. Our job is to get that message out there, to get that message to the people, to let people see the beauty of Islam in our actions, in our lifestyles, and in our speech. May Allah make us from those who are means of guidance for others and rightly guided. May He make us from those through whom others embrace Islam and may he make us from those who on the day of judgment we don't just get our good deeds but we get the good deeds of many 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 others who were influenced towards Allah through us wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen alhamdulillah alhamdulillah wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya wa man la nabiya ba'da amma ba'd Part of the universal message of Islam, and this one, this part te tends to get lost in some segments of the community, is that Islam embraces the good of every culture of the world. Right? Islam didn't come to enforce a specific culture upon humanity. And we see this in different parts of the world, different cultures where, you know, made, became part of Islam or that Islam kind of evolved around their cultures in, in different parts of the world. So for example, if you have to go to Turkey, or to Malaysia, or to Saudi Arabia, you will find that the cultures of these three lands are very different, but very Islamic. Right? Very different, but very Islamic. In that, when you go to the average person's house, you will see things like the Islamic culture of how to treat a guest, the Islamic culture of how to treat your neighbors, the Islamic culture of focusing on morality and modesty. But the way it manifests itself is different in every place and every time. And this got lost somehow when our forefathers migrated to this land. When our forefathers migrated to this land, we kind of lost this point. Instead of embracing the culture of this land and becoming Muslims within this culture, one of the mistakes people made was to try and force foreign cultures, to be specific and blunt, Indian culture, upon others in the name of Islam. And so it's very important that we understand and we differentiate between what is Islam and what is culture. Not so that we reject culture, but we learn to accept the different cultures of the world and we learn to understand that Islam accommodates all cultures, as long as we're looking at the good of the culture and not the bad. And so we have a principle in our religion. Right, this is a principle that governs a large portion of our fiqh. That principle is called al-adat muhakkama. The local culture is the deciding factor. And what this principle means is that the people of a specific culture, the practice of Islam will be according to that culture. And when they move to another culture, likewise the practice of Islam may change according to that culture. Not in the fundamentals, fundamentals never change, but in the details. I'll give you a few examples so you understand what do I mean by what changes and what doesn't change. What doesn't change? We pray five times a day. That doesn't matter what culture, time or place you live in. You pray five times a day. 
right? We cover our own. <coughs> for a man, that's from his navel to his knees. For a woman, it's everything except her face and hands. We cover our aura. That doesn't change, right? What do you use to cover your aura? Do you have to wear a thobe? Did you have to wear a kurta? Can you wear a shirt and pants? All of that is cultural. All of that is allowed, you dress according to your culture. You dress according to the time, the place, the occasion. Allah has left that flexible. Right? What doesn't change? Our morality. Zina will always be haram. Right? All forms of zina will always be haram. What changes? The details of the practicality. Right? So for example, Islam teaches us that the husband and wife have rights upon each other. Very interestingly, the Quran doesn't spell out what the exact rights are. Right? It simply says, وَعَاشِرُوا هُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Treat your wife well according to your culture. So the Quran, imagine if the Quran said, you have to give your wife a hundred gold coins every month. Right? And then time goes by, and now we live in a time when nobody works with gold coins, and hundred gold coins has a lot of value today. Right? It would be very impractical. But instead, the Quran came with a simple guidance. Treat your wife well according to your culture. What does that mean? How much money does a man need to spend on his wife every month? It depends on his culture, where he's from, his economic level, you know, how much he's earning, how much people of his economic level in his country are expected to spend on their wives. Right? It depends from different lands to different families to different tribes to different neighborhoods. Allah left it flexible. So we shouldn't try and constrict it. Whether it's the way we dress, whether it's the treatment of our family members, whether it's how we run our businesses. This is part of business law in Islam as well. A large portion of Islamic business law is dependent on culture. Simple example, right? Who provides transportation? Does the buyer provide the transportation or does the seller provide transportation? It's usually left up to culture. Islam doesn't dictate it. It leaves it up to culture. So the point I'm trying to get to is that sometimes we mix our religion and culture to a level that we get confused what is what. And then when we're doing da'wah to people, instead of calling them towards Allah, we call them towards our culture. And we expect people who are, for example, you know, to be blunt in our community, when someone who is not Indian converts to Islam, people want them to dress like an Indian, to talk like an Indian, and even to start eating spicy food. Right? That's not Islam. Let people be. Let people. Islam is universal in the sense that all of it is fine, in the sense, right? That you dress according to your culture as long as your aura is covered. You eat according to your culture as long as the food is halal. Right? You speak the language of your culture. It's all acceptable. Don't try to force culture upon people in the name of Islam. And you will find that if we go towards calling people towards Allah instead of calling them towards our culture, Islam will spread a lot faster. I really believe one of the reasons why Islam is not spreading in South Africa as fast as it should is because we are preaching our culture to people instead of preaching the message of Allah to people. And if we learn to differentiate culture from Islam and just preach to people what they need to hear about the oneness of Allah, about the fitrah, about the justice and the morality and the modesty of Islam, and we leave the culture aside, we leave them to follow their own cultures, a lot more people will flock towards Islam because they will recognize the universal values of Islam. And this is what will attract them towards the message of Islam, through which they too will find peace, through which they too will find the, 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 the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the best of both worlds. That we end by asking Allah to grant us all the best of both worlds. Allahumma Allahumma jannama ahadiya mahdiya Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurrata ajun wa jannana lil muttaqin imama Subhan rabbil izzati amma yadifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin aqib